So those things being said, uh, it's my privilege to introduce Robbie Dawkins in just a moment. Uh, you may, if you've come to Vineyard Conference in Anaheim, or if you went to the conference that he put on at Dwell, the church that was planted out of Coast Vineyard a few years ago now, if you went to that uh, conference, I forget how long ago that was, sometime last year, then you would have seen Robbie Dawkins there. If you didn't go to any of those things, you may be familiar with him through videos like Furious Love or Father of Lights. Um, so we're really excited to have him here. And I just want to say one thing on a, on a personal note before I call him up, and that's that one of the reasons that we are really excited to have him here is I think that he really embodies uh, a lot of our values here at Coast and also just in the vineyard at large. The value for the presence of the Spirit, the value for expecting God to show up and God to move and God to use us to do wonderful things and in the process of doing amazing things to, to reach out to people who, who don't know Jesus and show them the power of God and the love of God. Um, and at the same time, the value for the ministry of the whole body. That, that despite the fact that God uses some individuals in some just really incredible ways in healing and prophecy, that his call is for his body to do those things. And one thing that Robbie loves is just to equip the body to do the things of the spirit. And so we're really excited to have him here. Why don't you come on up, Robbie? And I'm just gonna take just a moment to pray over him before he speaks. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you so much for, for being able to have Robbie here with us today. And God just asks that you would use him in really just powerful ways to, to meet us today, and to minister to us today, and to equip us, uh, to prepare us for the works that you've called us to. And Lord, would you put your blessing on him and on his life and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. Bless you. You know, I met uh, uh, Jamie and Michelle the first time, um, I, I don't know if they remember when I met, but uh, we were in uh, San Antonio, Texas together, and uh, they were having a Vineyard Leaders uh, meeting, and we were doing a SWOT analysis, and we were in the same group. Do you remember that? And uh, we were in the same group, and, and sort of one of the things that uh, came out of uh, our processing uh, you know, it was, we were like, you know, we need to see more of the Holy Spirit and sort of where's the Holy Spirit? What's going on? You know, there's, uh, we weren't feeling like there was uh, enough of that. And when these guys said that, I was like, these are my people right here, man. I, I was like that. I am on board with these guys. And, uh, and so I was really uh, excited to, you know, to hear that and to hear their hearts. And just as we were sort of, you know, processing together going, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's exactly the same way that we feel. And so it's so good, you know, to know that, uh, you know, when you're sort of in those settings and, and you're feeling something to, to realize, oh, there's other people that, you know, sort of have a similar uh, sense and a similar, you know, sort of uh, desire, you know. And so, yeah, I would definitely say that, uh, you know, just even out of those questions that we're definitely on the same page. So that's really cool. Let me, if I could, if you'll give me the grace just to point out a couple of things. We've got a product table out here. All of the stuff that, that the sales of that goes to help me do missions trips because I'm really passionate about missions. I was born on the mission field. My parents were missionaries in Japan. And one of the things that used to always grieve my parents is they were like, we were, we were never able to bring any, you know, guest teachers or speakers in. We could never afford it and things like that. And so, you know, for me and my wife and, you know, uh, just our ministry, our big passion is to make sure and, and do this. And we actually just got contacted by... Um, a movement that's taking place in China called Back to Jerusalem. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's basically going back. Uh, the objective is through China to equip, uh, especially a lot of the Chinese people, uh, to go into various Muslim countries and to present the gospel and and uh, to uh, see them, you know, come into what they're experiencing in relationship with Christ. And I've had a big, big heart for Muslims for years. Uh, and I've been into many Muslim countries, many closed countries. Uh, I, th I think I've been in, out of the top 10 most closed countries that Voice of the Martyrs, you know, have stayed, I've been in seven of them. And, and so it's real passion, but uh, they've invited me to come and to help equip and to train, you know, because one of the elements that they want to see is 
prophetic and healing and deliverance and, you know, all of that, you know, in power evangelism. So anyway, just be praying about that. But um, it, it, my book, Do What Jesus Did, um, it, the premise of the book is Jesus didn't come to show us just what he could do as the son of God. He came to show us what we could do. Philippians chapter 2 says that, you know, when he came, you have to realize I've pastored in the hood for the past 17 years. So I'm not as polished <laughs> as somebody getting their doctorate or Michelle. I look at these guys and I'm like, so you, let's, guys, lower the bar for me this morning, okay? <laughs> Come on, show a little grace here. So I'm not as polished as these guys. But basically, God, you know, we see Jesus leaving his superhero God powers in heaven, according to Philippians chapter 2, and he comes as a normal human being. And what's his power source? power of the Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that's available to you and I. Uh, I was being interviewed by a disc jockey in Scotland, and he goes, you know, you say that we could do all the same stuff Jesus t could do, but there's only one problem. We're not Jesus. And I said, who lives inside of you? Jesus. And what's the source of his power? Power of the Holy Spirit. I'm like, you got all the ingredients that Jesus had to do what he did living inside of you. What are we waiting for? We just need a permission and a sense of realization that God's already given us the power to step out and to do it. And, you know, and so it, all of it's there. So anyway, uh, this is the book that kind of, you know, builds on that, explains that. I asked a friend of mine to write the foreword because he's trying to get a writing career going and I was just trying to give him a leg up, help out. So I asked Bill Johnson, to... <laughs> trying to help a brother out. That's all there is to that. Now, Bill's been a huge encouragement and supporter for us. And then also, we've got the field guide. This is the uh, breakdown of just kind of daily activities and things, activations, things to, for you to step out. These are really push you. I mean, these aren't, you know, this isn't the kindergarten version of it. it <laughs> it's going to push you. It's going to stretch you. And uh, so anyway, this, this could be used for home groups or just even for individuals that go along with that. I also did a six DVD set called Empowered Evangelism that goes in through all that. Most of the book covers that, but if you like DVDs instead, we've got that. And then we have these jump drives. The silver ones are video, the black ones are audio, and these are every single audio teaching that I've got back at that table, and then some that are not at the table that are on the website. Every single one of them are in this cute little jump drive. And then with the videos, it has every single video teaching. Now, Darren Wilson's films are not on the videos, so uh, that would be sort of like hacking or something like that. But uh, that, that, those aren't there, but you can get all the teachings, and, it's, and it works out to where it's less than 40% of the cost if you were to buy them all uh, individually. And so, again, Michael, if I could give these to you, sir, and um, if you could put those back at the table for me. But we'll have that open um, just uh, right at the end of the service. So, how are you guys doing? I just want to tell you, I don't feel sorry for any of you. You live here. I'm jealous. Every time I come here, I'm always like, I'm like, you know, it seems like your weather is perfect. You know, you realize how humid and hot. When I left, the, the, the heat index in, in central Illinois when I left was 105. It was 95. And the humidity was, I don't know, 5,000 or something. I, don't, I, I, don't, I didn't check that part. But it was like we were just pouring down sweat the whole time. I was out mowing my lawn, which I do for therapy. It's therapeutic for me. Uh, I got six boys, so I mean, I could easily make them do it. But, um, you know, I actually like doing uh, stuff like that when I'm home. And so, uh, but I was just like pouring down sweat the whole time, fighting off endless amount of mosquitoes. If you haven't heard of those, that's Illinois state bird, by the way. Um, so when I come here, I'm like, you, I just don't feel sorry for any of you. So don't whine to me about anything because I don't feel sorry for you. Uh, just, just a little bit of introduction, uh, just uh, uh, to take that a little bit further of what uh, the kind things Michelle said. Um, I, I planted a church, a vineyard church in Aurora, Illinois. When we planted our church, uh, Aurora was one of the worst cities in all of Chicagoland. Um, people were, churches were moving out. Uh, there was literally blood running in the streets on a daily basis. It was, it was a bad place. There was drugs, violence, all sorts of crime there. I went to meet with the chief of police and told them that we wanted to plant a church there. 
And he looked at me and he said, you're crazy. And he said, uh, the, and especially where you're wanting to plant, he said, that's the worst part of town. And he said, nobody, nobody plants a church there. All of them are folding. You know, he said, there's even the, many of the churches that have been shot up and, you know, you'll just be making a big, big mistake. And uh, that was him encouraging us. And then uh, I went and met with the mayor and he pretty much uh, said the same thing. And uh, even the, you know, the uh, church planting gurus of the vineyard were listening to where we were talking about and they looked at the demographics and they're like, so far, none of these have worked whenever anybody has done this. And we were like, well, this is what we feel God calling us to do. And, and this is where we're, what we're going to do. And part of it was that we believe that wherever people are desperate, there's going to be a higher level of kingdom activity. And a lot of people ask me in China and in, in Latin America and in India and in, in Africa, uh, you know, and I've been to all those places. Is there a, is it a higher level of faith that they have and why they see more stuff happen? And I always say, no, it's a higher level of desperation. Wherever you have a high level of desperation, you're going to see more kingdom activity. You're going to see more stuff happen. And we have a tendency to think, well, let's go where it's a little bit more safer, a little bit more commerce, and that'll be the easier place. Not true. It's wherever the higher level. Why? Because in a place where people are extremely desperate, there's a high level of risk. And risk, how do we spell faith? Two of you know that. R-I-S-K. I'm taking it that you are the representatives of the rest of the group, and that's really what it is. R-I-S-K. And so stepping out and taking risk is faith. Nobody's ever... We're like, I wish my faith would be easier. Well, if risk would be easier, that would be the case, but it's not. And risk is risk. And so stepping out and doing this, but we went to plant the church and, and we had uh, some really tough experiences. You know, we had uh, people that, that went through incredible highs and lows. We had also had a real heart for the uh, homosexual community and had been reaching out into Boys Town and taking trips and doing ministry trips there for years and, and saw, um, saw, really saw a lot of impact there. And uh, saw just an immense, uh, you know, an immense work that we saw take place there. And so, but that was really far. But we would have people that were driving from Boys Town, like in, inside Chicago, 45 minutes out to attend our church. And so there was just a lot of, a lot of really incredible things that were happening. But again, you know, uh, we, we just saw a lot of real, you know, in our area, just a lot of real rough things. But we would just go out and just pray for people, minister to people. And if you saw Father of Lights, if you saw that particular documentary of Darren Wilson's film, which, by the way, uh, Holy Ghost Reborn, which is sort of the second part of Holy Ghost, will be coming out this month. And so it's, it's being released this month. And, and I'm really excited about it because it's the first time anybody uh, caught me doing an equipping with somebody else. And seeing somebody get healed and ending, ending up giving their life to Christ, and which for for an equipper, that's the sweet spot. It's not me doing it. It's it's you know it's setting somebody else up to do it. That's my passion. And so, anyway, uh, it's it's really powerful film. But that that we would just do that just all the time. My kids do it. You know, my my family do it. Our leaders did it. It was a qualification of whether or not you were a leadership in ministry. You know, uh, people would come in, is this church going to make room for our ministry? And we're like, yeah, when we see you doing it out there, then you can do it in here. But it was just pretty simple. Uh, but we saw a lot of impact and a lot of, a lot of things happen, and it began to change our city. So much so that what, what you see happen in Father of Lights was the last of the top leadership of the Latin kings. And what was happening was in the city over the years was crime was dropping uh, and started dropping pretty significantly. And a lot of people were recognizing it was the efforts of our church because we weren't just doing it ourselves. We were equipping other churches in the area to do it. There are two Catholic churches in, in, in Aurora that had called me to come and to do power evangelism uh, training for them. And they would go out with us and we would, uh, their, their priests would come with us. I mean, it was amazing the things that we were seeing happen. And just all of a sudden the city began to transform. Well, like I said, what you see in Father Lights was the last of the leaders of, the, of, the, of that group of people. And they were threatening because they were losing respect. And respect in gang lingo means fear. If you fear me, you respect me. If you don't fear me, you don't respect me. And so they were losing respect. Nobody was afraid of them anymore. And what happened was is they had decided that in 2013, they were threatening that that would be the bloodiest year in all of Aurora's history because they weren't getting respect anymore. And so... Um, 
They were saying that there were going to be more drive-bys, there was going to be more, uh, more killings than ever before. Well, after what took place in that, uh, you know, in that movie with those guys, you know, bringing them to Christ in 2013, and you have to realize Aurora is a quarter of a million population. It's the second largest city in Illinois, uh, only second to Chicago. Uh, in the entire year of 2013, we did not have one homicide for the entire year. That has not happened for 67 years. 67 years. That story, uh, the, the Chicago Tribune dubbed Aurora the transformation city. And it wasn't because they'd seen the transformation videos, if any of you have seen it. It wasn't because of that. They named it on their own. And, and they, they were, they were the, uh, a chief of police from, uh, from Italy, a chief of police from France, flew over to study our police intelligence because they ended up laying off a third of the Aurora police staff because crime had dropped so dramatically that police were complaining about being bored. And so they ended up laying off a third of the police staff. And so these police officers came, these police chiefs came to study the police intelligence. And the, I remember the, on the BBC uh, network, the, the chief of police looked at him and he looked in the camera and he says, you cannot just study Aurora's police intelligence. He said, you've got to study that little vineyard church and what they've been doing and the impact that they've been making on the city. And the city ended up giving us two or three different awards for what had happened with it. Guys, my church was never more than 200 people. It wasn't a massive church. It wasn't a, but, but, but 200 people made an impact on a quarter of a million people. And literally that story went out to millions. And it was just because of just persevering and sticking with it. You have far more power and authority than you realize. And you have far more power and authority than you're currently using. And the Lord wants you to use it. The Lord wants to release it. He wants to stir in you more. You have, you have so much to give. And we're, we're always, we, but the problem is, is for the most part, we move into a place and so much of the church's messages have slipped into self-preservation type messages, self-improvement, self-analysis you know, analysis and self-improvement and how to, how to improve our, who we are. And those really are, are, are self-preservation. And let me tell you something, self-preservation is a death of faith in the church. It'll kill faith in the church. Why? Because it eliminates risk. We start moving. Jesus said, you know, Jesus said, unless you're willing to lose your life, is the only way you'll have it. And if you're willing to spend your life for the sake of the kingdom, it's the only way that you're going to have it. But if you try to save it, what's going to happen? You'll lose it. And so self-preservation just doesn't work. And so we have to spend ourselves. We have to spend ourselves, you know, for the sake of the kingdom. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to encourage you to push yourself out. Make yourself uncomfortable. You know, too, too much of what we've done in the Western church is look for places that fit what we want. And it's sort of a shopping list. And it's been very, many of us heard, sort of a consumerism mentality. We need to see ourselves as where can I go give? Where, where, where's a place that I can contribute? Man, I'm, t- I'm telling you, you know, you know where change in the world starts? In children's ministry. got quiet. <laughs> change of the world starts there. Change of the world starts across the street. It starts, if you're at school, it starts in the locker beside you. You know, I have a lot of young people come, I want, God's called me to do what you do. Well, well, guess what? Starts next door. Starts right across the street. Starts with approaching somebody you don't even know, asking them if you can pray for them. It starts with probably them spitting in your face and telling you to F off and say, well, sorry, what I, I said a nice part of that word, so don't mean it. <laughs> yeah, that's how it starts. But you don't quit. You don't quit. And that's what God's called us to. It's to spend ourselves, spend our reputation, spend what people uh, think of us. Spend, you know, not, be, not try to move in this place of self-preservation. Does this make sense? Yes. All right. I'm not sure if you're with me or not, but hopefully you are. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5. I want to encourage you to think a bit outside of the box. And again, I, people always tell me, they're like, you look at scripture weirder, in a weirder way than anybody I've ever known. And that's probably because, you know, I grew up in church my entire life and I would hear sort of this almost looping form of looking at scripture. And I was like, you know, there's got to be another way to look at it. So I like to look at the back end of, of, of scripture. I always like to look at the back end of things. Now, how many of you grew up in church? Raise your hand. 
You know, see, here's the problem. We all grew up in church who raised our hands. And so we've heard the stories over and over and over again. So we know what's going to happen next. So we always think the disciples and Jesus knew what was going to happen next. Do you know, I don't think that's true. I, I think they had no idea. I, I'm serious. I think we sort of think Jesus just knew, you know, he just woke up in the morning. and was like, all right, guys, come on, wake up, gather around. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You know, coffee's over there, creamer over there. Why? This is a vineyard church. It's what we do, you know. And then, uh, you know, pull up over here. Let me tell you what's going to happen today. Today, we're going to head to Capernaum. On our way to Capernaum, I'm going to heal 437 people. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to raise a guy from the dead. It's going to be amazing. We're going to multiply some food. But about noontime, I'm going to be hot, tired, thirsty, and hungry. And I'm going to send you guys ahead. I'm going to pull off by this little well outside of Samaria. I'm going to send you guys ahead to go get some food, bring it back. And while I'm chilling there, a woman with a really bad reputation is going to come up. And she's going to say, listen. And I'm going to say, well, listen, would you give me a drink of water? And she's going to, going to say, well, I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. You shouldn't be even talking to me. Why are you asking me this question? And he said, listen, I got water you don't know of. Basically, she's going to believe in me. It's going to blow her mind. It's going to blow the town's mind. Everybody's going to come to believe in me. You guys are going to come back and have a little bit of food. And you're going to say, hey, what are you doing talking to this woman? She's a Samaritan. You're a Jew. What are you doing here? And I'm going to say, we've already been through all that. Where's lunch? <laughs> and then we're going to go from there on to Capernaum. And on our way to Capernaum, we're going to heal 267 more people. And we're going to get there. It's going to be an amazing message. A lot of people are going to believe in me. And then we're going to go to bed. We sort of think that's how Jesus's day was. And that he just, I'm not convinced. Why? Because the Bible says he was just like us. He set aside those superhero God powers. And he was operating in a, in a natural form, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. So he had no greater advantage than we have, if you believe that passage. Okay? So with that in mind, the disciples aren't... A, so Jesus asked the disciples to do some pretty crazy stuff that really doesn't make any sense if you think about it. In a lot of ways. But the problem is, you and I have grown, who've grown up in church, or we've seen the movie version... How many of you remember Flannel Graph? Flannel graph. See, for you, you put, if you're under 30, put your hands down. I don't believe you for a minute. Because flannel graph was this flannel board, blue flannel board that they put up, and they had these, it had corduroy material on the back of these cartoon characters. They would stick it up, and then they would tell these Bible stories. And see, we grew up seeing all the flannel graph versions of this stuff. And flannel graph was just, you, and, and see, my, my parents also pastored in the hood. And so our, we, our, we had hand-me-down flannel graph. So, you know, the First Baptist Church had donated their flannel graph to us. And so ours was a little tattered, a little torn. So I always grew up thinking Peter was an amputee. <laughs> Somebody ripped off Peter's leg, and I just thought, Peter's an amputee. I don't get it. Jesus could multiply food, but he can't give Peter a new leg. That didn't make any sense to me. And so, but we've seen that flannel graph. You know what the new flannel graph is? Veggie tails. <laughs> Veggie tails has replaced flannel graph, right? So anyway, so we've grown up with that. So we've, now I want to take a look at this passage from the standpoint of these guys not knowing what's going to happen next. Can we do that? And give me a little grace. Remember, again, I kind of, I'm a little rough around the edges. Give me a little grace to sort of, you know, read into the text. We would call it exegeting the text. Let me, give me a little grace to sort of read in and read behind the scenes of the text to develop it. Will you do that? Okay, good. So Luke chapter 5. It says, one day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. That happens to Michelle every time she goes grocery shopping. <laughs> She's right there in the vegetable aisle and people just press on her, teach us the word of God. She's like, I'm only here for tomatoes. Back off, you know. So press on her to hear the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now, let's go out where it's deeper and catch some fish. All right, that's what the text says. Now, let me explain something here. Anybody knows uh, if you do public speaking and you don't have a sound system, you don't have a PA system, you got to get distance from your crowd. If you've ever preached or ministered in third world country, you know this. You've got to get distance from your crowd because you've got to be able to project for them to be able to hear you. And so Jesus is trying to get as far away. He's trying to get some distance so they can hear him, but they pushed him right up against the water. You know, his next steps are just getting wet and he's on a, probably on an incline. And so it's not a good position to be in. He looks over and based on what we know of the rest of the text, how long had Peter and his crew been fishing? All night. How much fish have they caught? No fish. How many of you know fishermen without fish 
are not nice people to be around. <laughs> They're not nice people to be around. So I think it sort of looks something like this. Now give me the grace to sort of build into the text. So I imagine Peter's over there and he's like, get that seaweed out of those nets. Get those seashells out of there. Is that a bicycle tire? Get it out of there. Get that Coke can out of there. I can't believe people throw their trash in this lake. We have to fish in this lake. We've been fishing all night long and we haven't caught any fish. I gotta go home and tell the wife. She's gonna say, where's the money? Where's the fish? I'm going to say, we don't have any money. We don't have any fish. And my mother-in-law lives with us. <laughs> She's going to say, I told you you should have married Barnabas. He's an accountant. He's bringing home a paycheck. <laughs> I hate this job. <laughs> I know the text doesn't say any of that. <laughs> This is not one of the synoptic gospels, so it's not right in sync. So give me a little grace. It's like written 85 years later, so work with me here. <laughs> so about that time, Jesus steps over to Peter and says, Hey, Peter, would you lend me one of your boats? I imagine Peter looks at him and says, You know what? You can have the stupid boat. I hate these boats. I hate this net. I hate this job. Yes, please take the boat. I'd sell it on eBay for five bucks if it was here yet. Right now, I want to chop, chop it up and sell it as firewood. Yes, take the boat. And Jesus is like, dude, I only want to borrow your boat, man. That's all I want to do. And he's like, take it. And he's like, okay. So he jumps in the boat, finishes his message. Right about the time Peter and his crew get the nets, perfectly clean. They're all cleaned out. They're hanging them up to dry in the nice, warm Middle Eastern sun. They're grabbing their lunch boxes. They're heading home so they can go sleep and come back and do it all over again the next night. Right as they're walking away, Jesus looks and says, hey, Peter, I've got an idea. Let's go fishing. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? This is crazy. I imagine Peter looks back and goes, you're not from around here, are you? I don't know if you've noticed, but you're in the Middle East. Here in the Middle East, fish are cold-blooded creatures. They don't stay up to the surface when the sun's out. See that yellow disc in the side? That's called the sun. When that's up, fish get as far away from that thing as possible because they're cold-blooded creatures. You obviously know nothing about fishing. You should go build an armoire. <laughs> But then Peter says something profound. He says, but because you say so, we will. Because you say so, we will. Don't forget those words. And so can you imagine Peter trying to talk his crew back in the boat? These guys are exhausted. And he's like, come on, guys, just go with me. Let's get back in the boat. And they're like, no, Peter, have you lost your mind? Are you taking fisher, fisherman tri trips from the, from the, the, the rabbi who, who was a carpenter? Are you serious, Peter? No, we're not getting back in the boat. We need to go rest and get refreshed so we can come back tomorrow night and do it again where there actually may be fish you know, at the surface. No, we're not doing it. Peter's like, oh, please, come on. Maybe he'll give us a tip or something. So let me get my mother-in-law off my back. Please, come on. Let's get in the boat. Come on. And he finally coaxes them back in the boat. What about all the other fishermen crews at Shrine? What about them? They're going, hey, Peter, what are you doing? Are you going out and going fishing? Didn't you notice that it's daylight? Are, are you serious? Peter, what are you doing? And they're like, Do you, are, are you listening to the rabbi? Seriously? And Peter's like, yes. And they're like, hey, look at crazy Peter. He's going back out. And he's like, please don't laugh. As he does the row of shame out to the middle of the lake. And then he gets out to the middle of the lake and he's like, all right, you obviously don't know what fishing looks like. And you just want a demonstration. We stand at the edge of the boat and we throw the nets over and we wait for fish like this that are not there. They're all at the bottom. We found that out all last night. You better give me a tip or something. And Jesus goes, Peter, I know what's wrong. You see, you have your net on the wrong side of the boat. 
<laughs> if you would pick your net up from this side of the boat and put it over there on that side of the boat, <laughs> it's simple. You catch fish. I imagine Peter going, really? Really? Jesus, let me get this straight. You think six, eight feet over, lying under the brim of the water. There are fish under there going. <laughs> they have their net on the wrong side of the boat. They don't realize we're over here. Shh. They'll never know. Trust me, Jesus, that's not happening. But because you say so, we will. And the crew's like, no, Peter, don't do it. All the other crews are watching back and shore. They'll be laughing at us. They'll never let us. No, Peter, don't. He goes, come on, guys, they're laughing anyway. Let's just get this over with. And so he picks his net up and he says, see, I told you there's no fish. <gasps> there's fish. Pull the net up. They pull the net up. It's filled with fish. He drops it in the boat. Throw it over again. They throw it over again. Fills up again. Pull it up again. They pull it up again. He throws it in. Drop it over again. It fills up again. He's like, they were under there all night long. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at us. We were on the wrong side. And all of a sudden, Peter realizes he's got another boat back at shore. And he's like, hey, get that boat out here. We got fish. Not that side of the boat. Put it on the other side. Put an X on it. That's a sweet spot side. And then all the other crews are like, Crazy Peter was right. Get the boats, get the nets. Let's get out. We were on the wrong side of the boat. <laughs> and they all come out and imagine this. The Bible says both boats so filled with fish that they barely make it back to shore. They barely make it back to shore. They're sinking all the way. What did Peter want? Fish. What did Jesus give him? fish. So he's back at shore. Peter jumps out of the boat. And the Bible says he dropped to his knees. And it hits Peter. The difference wasn't in the technique or the skill. Peter was a professional fisherman. He knew his trade. It hits Peter. The difference was in the presence that was in the boat. The presence in the boat made all the difference. And the Bible says he drops to his knees in front of Jesus and he looks at him and he says, Jesus, right now, you need to go away from me. You're too good. I'm too bad. A guy as good as you are should not be this close to a guy as bad as I am. If you hang around me, I'll disappoint you. I pretty much disappoint everybody. Yeah, Jesus, the best thing you can do right now is just, is just go away. Jesus looks at him and he goes, oh, Peter, you don't get it. You've spent your entire life going after minnows. And I made you for the big catch. I didn't make you to catch fish. I made you to catch people. And you've been going after the wrong catch. And what Jesus says next to Peter is quite unimpressive. He looks at Peter and he says, hey, Peter, follow me. Have you ever noticed there's not much of a pitch in that? <laughs> it's not much there. Follow me. Who would respond to that? But yet, the Bible says Peter abandons the boat, the net, the fish. Peter probably had been crying out to God all night long the night before for those fish. 
and he just walks away from them to follow Jesus. He abandons them and says to follow him. What did Peter want? Fish. You know what Jesus wanted? Because you say so, we will. When it doesn't make sense. When we will look the fool. When others will reject us, laugh at us, mock us. When the culture will reject us. Just simply because you say so. I learned long ago, God doesn't owe it to me to make sense. But I owe him everything. Absolutely everything. And Jesus is looking and saying, because you say so, we will. I can build a church on that that hell itself can't stand against. It'll go through thousands of years of persecution and torment, and it will grow and prevail just simply because you say so. We will. Think about Matthew. Jesus goes up to Matthew, probably with a table filled with money. He was a tax collector. And he steps up to his table and says, hey, Matthew, follow me. And the Bible says Matthew abandons his table, probably filled with money, to just follow Jesus. Makes no sense. Can you imagine these guys going past their family members? Excuse me, where are you going? I'm following him. To do what? He didn't say. <laughs> For how long? He didn't say that either. And why are you doing this? Because everything inside of me screams out to be where that presence is no matter what. I don't care about success. I don't care about fame. I don't care about wealth. I care about being near that presence no matter what. No matter what. Abandoning all just to follow him. You see, the picture of those fish and those nets with Peter, that was a prophetic picture. Because when Jesus said, Peter, will you lend me your boat? That boat represented Peter's life. And he's saying, Peter, you let me put my presence on your life. We'll catch far more than you could ever catch. Will make a greater impact than ever than you could ever catch. Let me put my presence on your boat. Lend me your boat. Lend me your life. It'll change the world. That was a prophetic picture that would be fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when Peter and the disciples stood up, the presence filling their boats, and thousands came running at the sound of the presence. Just like those fish into those nets. Will you lend them your boat? Will you lend them your boat when it can mean your reputation? Will you lend them your boat when it can mean your life? One day in our church, in Aurora, every year I, I do a talk on sex. And it's a two-part talk. And we biblically go through and break down and explain what sex is. Sex, God created sex as a blessing on marriage. It is the best, the best sex is in marriage. Sex outside of marriage is not the best, and it never will be. Because God's blessing on marriage was sex. And that's how it works, and that's what God in, intended it to be. And so I sit there and explain that, if any, and I tell everybody, if anybody has you know, not followed that, and not today, you can get that set straight, you can come forward, but this is the best way it is because I'm not going to lie to you and I'm not going to try to make you feel good. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I just lay it out and say, you know, this is the way that it is. Well, it just so happened, the number two guy in the Latin King, his street name is Hitler, his girlfriend had been coming to our church for about two months and she had prayed, given her life to Christ. And she was there that morning when I was doing part one of that. And so she goes home and she tells Hitler, I'm not having sex with you anymore. Because Robbie said. 
sex outside of marriage is sin and it breaks God's heart, and I'm not going to break God's heart. Now, you can imagine how Hitler responded. This warm feeling came across him. <laughs> Tears began to flow down his face, and he looked up at her and he says, I love Robbie. We're going to do whatever that man says. He's a man of God. That's not what he said, but that's sort of my fantasy of what I wish he said. He looked at her and he says, you go tell that preacher, I'm coming there next Sunday and I'm sitting on the front row. And if he doesn't get up and take it back and say he's wrong, I'm going to pop him in the head in front of the whole church. And she called me on the phone and she's crying and she's like, Robbie, you can't get up to preach next Sunday. She goes, you know Hitler, he's a killer, he'll do it. And I said, he's not going to show up. He's just mad. He's just ticked off. I said, it'll blow over. He'll calm down. He's not going to show up. I said, but you stick with what Jesus was telling you to do and the Lord will bless you. And I said, don't back off and don't let him intimidate you. I said, you do what Jesus says and he'll protect you. I said, but he's not going to show up. And she goes, yes, he will. And I said, nah, he won't. So the next Sunday... I go, to, I go to the church, and I'm sort of in, in my little closet office thing, and sort of preparing you know, uh, myself. And Carlos Lopez, our worship pastor, who had also come out of the Latin Kings, he comes running in, and he's like, dude! That's sort of like saying pastor for us, you know? <laughs> in Southern California, you understand. And so uh, he says, dude! He goes, Hitler's here, and he's strapping. And I was like, he is? And he said, yeah. And I said, you saw it? And he says, yeah. He says, he's got the gun right in the back of his pants. He said, dude. He goes, please don't ask me to disarm him. And I'm like, no, no, no. I said, I said but here's the deal. I said, we, we got to change everything. I said, tell the girl who's doing the announcements. She's one of our home group leaders. I said, tell her I'm doing announcements. He goes, you want to do worship too? And I said, no. You're doing a worship. I'm preaching. I'll do announcements. So, and so we get in there, and, and I, I get up, and sure enough, he's sitting on the second row, like right there. And I get up, and I'm like, uh, and I go to do the announcements, and I would love to say how confident I was and how secure I was, but I'm like, welcome to the vineyard. We're so happy to have all you here, and we're so glad that you've come. And people in the back are going, oh, the Holy Spirit's on Robbie right now. <laughs> His hands are shaking. Look at his voice cracking. More, Lord. <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you know, the bathrooms are over here. Children's are there. Coffee. And I'm moving really fast because if he's going to take a shot, I'm going to be a moving target. I'm not going to make it easy for him. And so, but he's just sitting there and he's looking, his head's cocked to the side and I'm moving here and here and here and here and his eyes never move. And I'm like, what's going on? And so I went into part two. I didn't change anything. Did a recap on part one. Didn't change a thing. And so I get towards the end of the message and I keep looking at him and I'm like, okay, what's happening? What's going on? And he's just sitting there still just, you know, and I was like, what's up? And so I had, we had a few words of knowledge from our team. People came up for healing and, and uh, some other things. And, and I keep watching him. And all of a sudden, about the time ministry started, he goes, and he just gets up and he quietly just walks out. He shakes his head a few times and just quietly walks out. And I was like, what's going on? And so later that afternoon, I called her on the phone and I said, hey, I said, I, I, I noticed that he came and she goes, well, I was too scared to come. What happened? And I told her, you know, what I saw. And I said, well, what did he say happened when he came back? He said, he wouldn't say a word. She said, he just said, that place is weird. I'll never go back there ever again. Those people are freaks. <laughs> and I said, she said, what, so what did he do? I said, he didn't do anything. He just sat there. This is really strange. And so she goes, that's really bizarre. And so several weeks passed, and, and the, uh, in Aurora and the Chicagoland, they, did a, they arrested 23 of the top Latin kings. The number one guy they were after was Hitler. We've got a picture for you, if we could pull, pull that up. This was on the front page of the newspaper and the Chicago Tribune and throughout. Uh, and Hitler is the guy where it's got the band going across. He's the guy where it's going across his eyes at the bottom. On that side, second to the bottom, that's Hitler. And so you can leave that up for a minute. Uh, but he, he was there, and, and there was like, uh, he, he, I saw the paper, and I was like, oh, my goodness. And his brother, whose his street name is Pistol Pete, he, he's a drug dealer that goes to our church. Now, he, come to, he would come to our church every week. And so I, I called him on the phone, and I said, I want to talk to you. And he said, well, I'll be at church Sunday, but I don't want to talk on the phone right now. And so I said, okay. And so when he got there, I could 
found out why, and it's because he was under investigation too. And so I told him, I said, you get word to Hitler that I'm coming to see him in prison. He said, probably they got six murder charges against him. He said, they're, they're not going to let you see him. And he said, and he, they're in isolation. I can't get any word to him. I said, you tell him I'm coming to see him. And I said, and get word to him. I said, don't lie to me. I know you can get word to him. And he said, okay, I will. And so I went there and I showed up on Thursday and he came walking in and he had the orange jumpsuit and his hands were cuffed, his legs were shackled. And man, I've never seen anybody so angry in my entire life. He comes shuffling in and he looks at me and he's like, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to talk to you. And he goes, well, I got a question for you. And I was like, okay, what's that? And he goes, what did you do to me that day I came to your church? I said, what do you mean, what did I do to you? I said, I didn't do anything to you. And he goes, he goes, yes, you did. He goes, as soon as I sat in that seat, I was frozen and I couldn't move. He goes, did you hex me? <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't hex you. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, as soon as I sat in that front seat, I couldn't move. He said, I was going to pop you in the head in front of your whole church. He goes, what did you do to me? And I said, dude, I didn't do anything to you. I said, Hitler, that was Jesus preventing you from doing something stupid, man. I said, dude, you don't understand. I said, and I was just using basic street terms that he would understand. I said, you've made this life for yourself. And you thought it was the best life. And I said, and you thought you were making something that was strong and powerful. I said, but the truth is, it's all jacked up and twisted and messed up. And it's all broken and busted. And I said, it's landed you here in this prison. But you thought it was the best. I said, but sitting here across the table, I said, Jesus has this life that he designed for you, that he made for you to live. But you've settled for the jacked up, twisted life and not the life you were made to live. And I said, here's the deal that's on the table, Hitler. Jesus is saying, let's make a deal. I'll do a trade. I'll take the jacked up, twisted life and I'll give you the life you were always meant to live. And I said, that's the deal Jesus is offering you today, Hitler. I said, will you take the deal? And he shoves away from the table and he goes, that deal's not for me. He goes, that deal's for people like you and Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. And he said, six murder charges? He goes, Robbie, they don't know the half of what I've done. He later confessed to me that he killed 18 people. He said, Robbie, I've burned men alive in their cars and I would look through their windows and laugh at them as they died. And he said, I've gone too far. He said, the deal's not for me. I looked at him. I said, Hitler, I said, you don't understand. I said, this is the Bible. And I said, we call this the holy word of God. And I said, this portion of the Bible is called the New Testament. And I said, Hitler, this is read as the word of God, direct from God. And I said, Hitler, half of this portion of the Bible was written by a murderer who was killing God's own people. And God chose him to write what we call Holy Scripture and we read as his very own voice. I said, Hitler, don't you see the deal? It's still on the table. And with that, he dropped his head and he burst into tears and he said, I'll take the deal. I'll take the deal. And right there, we prayed together. And I saw this hard-hearted murderer just pray and give his life to Jesus. And when he lifted his head, his brother later told me, he goes, you saw Hitler cry? And I said, yeah. He said, Robbie, he said, I've never seen my brother cry. He said, even when he was six years old and I'd watch my stepdad beat him till he was nearly dead when he was six, I never even then saw him shed one tear. He said, Robbie, I've never seen him laugh either, unless he was torturing somebody. He said, you saw him cry? I said, yeah. And as soon as he prayed and he lifted his head, this huge smile came across his face. And he rolls his shoulders and he begins to giggle like a little kid. And he says, it's gone. It's gone. He said, it's all gone. And I said, what's gone, Hitler? And it was like right out of the book, Pilgrim's Progress. He goes, he goes, it's like I had this huge rock strapped to my back. And he goes, as soon as I said that prayer, he goes, it all just snapped off. He goes, the anger, the rage, the hatred for people, it just snapped off as soon as I said that prayer. 
He goes, it's really gone. I can't believe it. It's gone. And he starts giggling. And about that time, the, the guard comes in and he says, all right, time to get back to your cell. And Hitler jumps up and says, yes, sir. And the guard looks at me and he's like, whoa. And I was like, he leads him back to his cell. I would go back every week and I would sit there with him. And I had to buy him a children's pictured Bible because he could barely read. And we would sit there and go over. We would study the life of Joseph. We would go through talking about these people, doing what Jesus said. No matter what, even when it's hard, we do what he says because he knows better than we do. And we would go through and explain this and show this, and show the grace and the love of God. And he would just look at this little children's picture Bible as we would go through that. And one day he was sitting there studying it and we were talking about these different stories. And he was looking at it, studying it. And he looks up at me and he goes, Robbie, and I said, yeah, Hitler. And he says, Robbie, I got to get my story out. And I said, what do you mean? He said, Robbie, people don't know how far Jesus will go for them. And he goes, I really don't think anybody's telling them. I said, Hitler, what are you talking about? He said, Robbie, you can hate God so much. And he just keeps coming after you. And he doesn't stop. And he keeps coming after you. And he won't relent. He said he'll send the guy that you want to kill to come and tell you the greatest news you've ever heard. Even though you hate him. He just doesn't stop. And he said, Robbie, people don't know that. And I looked at him, I said, Hitler, I said, dude, I love you. I said, but let me explain to you. I said, if you get your story out, I said, I'm scared that that could get you the needle or that could get you popped by the kings. And I said, dude, I don't want you to die. I said, I want you to live, man. You know what he said to me? He looked at me and he said, you told me they all died for this. He said, you told me this is worth giving everything for. Now you're trying to tell me I should try to save my own skin. He said, Robbie, the past few months in this stinking rotten prison have been the best months of my entire life. If they took me out today, it would be worth every one. And he said, Robbie, people out there don't know how far Jesus will go. And I really don't think anybody's telling them. And I said, dude, you get it. You get it. Oh, that we, the church, would get it the way Hitler gets it. Will you lend him your boat? Will you lend him your boat when it can mean your life? Will you lend him your boat when it can mean your reputation, what people think of you? If I were to ask how many of you would be willing to lay down your lives for Jesus, Almost all of us would raise our hands. But we just don't want to look stupid for him. And that holds us back. Lend him your boat. Just simply say, because you say so, we will. When it doesn't make sense, just simply because you say so, we will. We will. Father, I pray for my friends right now that, Lord, there would be a stirring that you would fill these boats with your presence. Ruin us with your presence. Make us undone for the ordinary, the average. Make them become tasteless to us. And to move into the extravagance of who you are. To spend our lives for the sake of your kingdom. just simply because you say so. Now, if you're sensing the Spirit speaking to you, and right now you're saying to, inside yourself, I haven't been willing to spend myself like that. I haven't been willing to put myself out, but I'm hearing the Lord calling me to that. But I've been operating in fear, and I need courage to do that. I want to do that, but I need courage to do that. And I would if I had that courage. If that's you, I just want you to stand right now. Be honest and stand right now.
It's always interesting to me because it's always the most courageous in the room that really stand first. Father, I thank you for what is standing in this room right now is enough to change this entire state. You don't need much. You just need a few that are all in. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Fill us. Let our reputations mean just as much to us as they did to Jesus. Lord, fill us with that place of spending everything we have for you. Just a second call. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you've never walked that out, stay standing if you were standing. Don't, don't move. But if you have never given your life to Jesus and you want to do that today, I just want you to raise your hand right now. If you've never made that decision, just lift your hand up right now. Okay. Yeah. Two or three of you. Let's all pray together with these who've lifted their hands. Father, I thank you. Just repeat after me. Father, I thank you for your love. And I receive that love today. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Jesus, come into my life. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your love. Every bit of who I am, I give to you. Fill me now, Holy Spirit, to always follow the ways of Jesus. I commit my future to you and all that I am. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do something else. If you're part of the ministry team, I want you just to come down to the front here, if you would. I wanted you to join me. There's a couple of things where I felt like some people needed some healing for, and I want to give those words. It could be other things. We'll pray for anything. But if there's anybody, anybody that was coming here today or, or you've had some problems with headaches and you're in pain right now, raise your hand. If you're in pain right now because you have been having problems with headache, raise your hand if you would. It's harder for me to see now with the lights, but wave it if I can. That would probably help. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. Come forward if you would. I want to pray for you. The Lord's going to heal you. Um, just come forward. We want to pray for you. God will heal you up here. I just saw that, that was, there was a couple of people. And also, there's somebody who's having a problem with the lower part of your back. I felt like it was either through a car accident or some sort of energy, but the lower part of your back where you're in front. Come up here. These guys will pray for you up here. Um, and, and then if, if you were having that problem with the lower part of your back, raise your hand if that's you. Okay. All right. Come up here. I want to pray for you. Um, and then somebody else too, that there was some, it was either some shoulder or neck damage where there was, uh, where you've been having problems turning your neck or there's been some stiffness in your neck. Raise your hand if that's you. Okay. Guys, come up here. We want to pray for you too. Um, we'll pray for anything also, uh, with the right knee. And I'm not sure if it's the meniscus or if it's like a, it, I think it even may be something in the back that's affecting the knee, but that you're having problems, especially with your right knee. If anybody having problems with the right knee and they're having pain in that area, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Come up. We're going to pray for you. Father, I just thank you for your presence. Let's all stand if we would. Father, I just thank you for your presence, and I thank you, Lord, just for all of those here, Lord. I thank you for the stirring of your spirit. Yeah. Also, somebody has been battling some insomnia, and it's been pretty, pretty rough. You've had a pretty, especially the past three nights, it's been pretty rough getting some sleep. If that's you, raise your hand if you've been having some problems with some insomnia.
Okay. Anybody here too? Yeah, just come on up. If, you, if that's you, I want to pray for you too. Um, I just saw just some real healing uh, and just some real, it felt like there's a lot of worry and fear that's been kind of holding you back on that. So Lord, we just thank you for that. Holy Spirit, just come, fill us. Fill us up. And then just the last call, and this, and this, this, you can just fill the front with this. You don't have to stand in line, but just, but if you're just like, I, 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 I've been doing this, I've had some of this, but I just need just a fresh sense of God's presence on me. I just need a fresh charge of the Spirit on me. If that's you and you want that, I just want you just to come down here and come up in the front. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I know there'll be a lot of you, but just come up here and just stand in the front. Uh, just you're just saying I just need a stirring of his presence I just need that that refreshing come up here right up here I just need that refreshing on my boat again I just need that stirring on my and step up a little bit closer to make some room for other people that are coming behind you yeah yeah more Lord yeah for those of you that are back at your seats that don't need prayer the, the band is going to lead in, in a worship song here but um, I just, just any available ministry team people that you can just help me just pray for these guys and we just want to bless them. Father, we just thank you. Now, Holy Spirit, come. Just fill all those here right now. Just pray for a stirring of your presence, just a refreshing of your spirit, Lord. Just charge us again. Charge us again. Lord, where there's been anything that's been diminished, where there's been anything that's been robbed, Lord, we just thank you for restoring just everything, Lord, just restoring everything that the enemy has tried to steal or tried to deplete from us. Lord, we thank you that you don't leave us that way. But by the power of your spirit, Lord, that it's increasing. Now fill them up, Holy Spirit. Come, more, Lord. And some of you that are up here, you're just beginning to feel tingling or heat or you're beginning to feel just your legs are shaking. You're just feeling God's presence on you. If you came up in response to this and you're feeling that on you, just raise your hand right now. If you're feeling that on you, yeah, about a third of you. More, Lord, turn it up, Holy Spirit. Turn it up, Holy Spirit. More, more, stir, stir, go deep, go deep. More, Lord, more, Lord. get a few more prayers to come on up. I know there's... You may or may not be on the ministry team, but there's plenty of people in this congregation that are fully equipped to pray for others. And it would just be great if we could lay hands on as many people who are up here as possible. So, you know, please come on up and, uh, and, and help pray for these folks. Thanks. It says Robbie was, was calling us up to, to receive prayer and just as he was inviting us, I would, I would, I would do this uh, if I wasn't afraid. <laughs> you know, if I, if I, if I didn't feel foolish. I want to just pray over all of us for, for boldness and for, for freedom from just the, the chains that are put on us from the, the fear of man. It was, it was a funny moment as he was starting to give invitation to ministry. And, uh, and I realized I wasn't even paying attention. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I was lost in my own, I was lost in my own thoughts and the things that I was hoping that God would do in my life and in our lives. And all I heard, you know, was, was I, would, I would do this if I wasn't afraid. Um, and there's something in my heart that just says, yes, you know, let's, let's not be afraid. And so I just want to pray over us the, the, the breaking off of fear. So Holy Spirit, would you, would you break fear off of every person in this room. God, we're, we're, wherever we live in the fear of man, wherever we live in the fear of looking foolish, God, wherever we're bought into wanting to be saved, but not so bought into wanting to actually act like Jesus by, by going out and doing the ridiculous things that he did, or act like his followers by obeying his commands even when we don't understand and we don't know what to expect. God, would you give us the freedom and the boldness to be the people that you've called us to be? That, that none of us would be afraid of looking foolish in front of human beings, but God, that we would, with all of our hearts and with all of our beings, strive to do the things that you're calling us to do and to be filled with faith just as, as, as Hitler in the story that Robbie told us was filled with faith to believe that, that God was actually calling him. Uh, God, would you, would you put that in us, the faith to believe that you're actually calling us? 
And that when we obey you, that you're actually going to back us up. That you're going to be there to do the things that you said you would do. We're going to just continue to pray here as long as we feel the the Holy Spirit is moving. Uh, so you know, we may have a we may have a ministry time today that extends beyond our our usual service length. Uh, and so I just want to encourage people. There there may be a few more words. There may not be a few more words. Uh, you know if if you've got some place to be, then feel free. And also just feel free to stay here and to, and to pray with us for as long as the, the Holy Spirit is, is going to continue to move. I'm going to pray a blessing over us. And, you know, and again, we'll just continue to, to minister to each other for as long as the, the Holy Spirit is moving here. So um, if you're not doing anything else, you can go ahead and take the hands of people who are standing near you as we do each week. But if you're engaged in prayer, please don't feel obligated to, to break up anything that you're doing. And we just, we receive today this word from you, Lord. We receive the call that you've given to us. God, would you cause us to be your people in every sense? Lord, would you fill us with your presence, Lord? Would you fill us with your power? Would you make us like you? Would you give us the courage to speak of you everywhere that we go? Would you free us from our fear? Would you cause us to walk in faith? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.